welcome to the Spent the Rent podcast. I am your host, Patty Rose. My guest today is immigration lawyer Abigail Molina. Abigail, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, and I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is really good. Uh, beginning the new year, I wanted to talk about fresh starts, and one of the main things that we're going to focus on today, or the thing that we're going to focus on, is immigration. So people getting a fresh start and the troubles and challenges of that. So you are an immigration lawyer in Springfield or Lane County, is that correct? Yes, I have an office and, in Springfield. And so what led, your, what led you to focus your law practice strictly on immigration? Well, I really honestly fell into immigration about 20 years ago. I graduated from the University of Oregon with a bachelor's degree. And I thought I was going to save the world. I think everybody graduated with a bachelor's degree thinks that they can. And I studied international studies with a focus in Latin American um, concentration. And I thought at one point that I would live in Mexico. And so I've always kind of been, had that interest. But um, when I got out of college, I was like waitressing and just looking for odd jobs here and there. Couldn't really find my place. Um, and then landed as a legal assistant for an immigration attorney. And I swear that the very first day, I knew that that's what I was supposed to do. It all kind of clicked together for me. So I worked there for about seven years. And then um, my husband actually finally uh, convinced me to go to law school. Yeah, that's pretty rad after, after like you were saying, being a server and then now you're an attorney. That's a pretty long process, I'm sure. So now you, you and your husband lived in, and if people are unfamiliar, your husband is Mark Molina. He's been a guest on my show a few times. Shout out to Mark. He's Him and I work a lot behind the scenes on our podcasts and he's a great guy. So uh, you lived, you and Mark lived in South Texas uh, and so I'm sure that your take on immigration was very different than what people would see in Oregon. So what did your time in South Texas show you that people in Oregon might not see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right after law school, we moved to South Texas. We were right on the border. Um, and so I did a lot of work in the detention centers there. And I expected to see a lot of people from Mexico and Central America. But what I really saw was just people from around the world. I hadn't realized um, how many people come in through the through our southern border border there. So I worked with people from India, from Africa, from Asia, just all over the place and realizing that everyone really um, has that same goal of coming here, seeking safety, um, seeking a better life, uh, whatever their goals might be, had to sacrifice a lot and uh, had very lengthy trips to get here, very expensive um, ways of getting to the U.S. Um, and really the struggle that, that was common between everyone. Right. Now, the last four years have been challenging as far as immigration policy, uh, to say the least. What is the fallout? And this is going to be you know, a broad, I mean, this is a big question, but what is the the big fallout from the last four years of Trump's anti-immigrant policies? You know, when Trump took office, I said to myself, okay, it's a shock, um, but how bad can it really be? Uh, as the president, you, you would hope that there isn't that much power there that can go unchecked. And most uh, immigration uh, policies usually come through legislation, which requires Congress. So, I said to myself, I was a little bit naive, um, thinking that it couldn't change very much. Um, but the last four years have literally been hell um, for immigrants, for immigration attorneys. And I try not to focus on our experience as attorneys because it's not our lives. You know, my life will go on. I get to go home to my family. I don't have to be worried about de being deported, um, you know, any anytime soon um, until they decide to start, you know, deporting the immigration attorneys too. That's, Trump, um, that's Trump's second term. No, <laughs> exactly. That's Trump 2.0. Right. Um, but I, so I try not to focus on the difficulty it's been to to me and my colleagues, but it has been <clears throat> it's been just super difficult changes on the daily. Um, you know, immigration is hard as it is. It, they say that it's the second most complicated law, second only to tax law. Um, <clears throat> so it's complicated as it is. And then to have uh, an administration that is just dead set on, um, you know, obliterating legal immigration um, as well as undocumented individuals, you know, an administration that would come against a DACA program that we're going to talk about today, um, you know, where the majority of Americans support DACA. Right. So just the, seeing the impact on my clients um, and my colleagues, I think that the impact has been, the, the desire, the intent has been 
to um, take take out immigrants and take out their defenders at, at the same time. I mean, I I wonder. So a lot, oftentimes, it's no secret that I'm very progressive, but but a lot of times I try to get into the mind of people with different views. At least you know, and I mean, I have friends with different views, but I really my father. I, but I just try to understand it. So I'll watch different channels and different sources and read different things. But I wonder what it is that makes the politicians on the right, like Trump, push these anti-immigrant policies. And my takeaway is, is that it's just a form of populism to use people's fears to get them to turn out to vote. You know, so the one of the things that with these Trump flags that you see that to a lot of people, what that represents is an anti-immigrant stance because he's got a hard fist or a strong fist. And that's because, you know, he, he doesn't have conviction. Trump has, he doesn't actually stand for anything other than shower me with affection. That's all he cares about. But when he can, he can get surrounded by people like Sebastian Gorka, uh, Stephen Miller, these very, I mean, they're racist people. It's not even, it's, it's not questionable if they're horrible people they're disgusting people there's there's some people that are less disgusting in the administration but, but those particularly are vile and they basically use hate and anti-immigrant policy to drive the voters to turn out absolutely and you, you hit the the nail on the head with um playing on people's fears you know he came trump came into office saying you know these these immigrants they're rapists they're murderers well some of them i presume are very fine people but yeah. you know, meanwhile calling uh, uh racial extremists like very fine people also um you know so i think it's it really plays on the fears of people uh were struggle it, when, whenever the economy struggles immigrants are scapegoated yeah. Um, you know, anytime that, that there's, you know, God forbid that somebody, you know, uh, go out and work in the strawberry fields, <laughs> you know, this whole thing of immigrants are still in our jobs. I don't see anybody lining up to go pick strawberries. Right. Well, and then there's this whole push, you know, because crime will happen, obviously, and there will be horrendous crime, just like in any other, you know, like I, I looked up some of the statistics and I don't have the exact numbers, but basically undocumented immigrants have a slightly higher crime rate than legal immigrants, but both are far below natural born citizens. And it's just not even close, you know, but I hear it like when I was talking to my dad the other day and he made some comment about, well, good, you know, now that Biden's in there, they're just going to let people come in. And then, I mean, there was a guy down in Texas that chopped up some young girl and it's like, that, okay, like that is, yes, that's hor horrendous. And yes, you're going to do things to prevent this. But like you were just talking about these people in the fields, working strawberry fields or whatever, uh, that are you know low paying, high work jobs. People don't want to do that, and it props up our economy by having these uh, immigrants involved in the in the system. Now you had mentioned DACA, and I did an episode back. It's been quite a while on DACA with my friend Ricky because him and I were talking, and it's when I had a light bulb moment. I hate to admit it, I didn't know a lot about it. It was his birthday, and it actually was the expiration day of DACA at the same day. Mm -hmm. it, I think it was a week from, from the day that we were talking. And I was like, how's it going? He's like, well, my birthday is on Friday or next week, whatever. He's like, but it was December 5th, and that was the, the – it might have been March 5th at the time. It, I'm getting dates confused. Anyway, either way, we were talking. He said, my birthday's coming up, but it's also the expiration of my citizenship. And I was like, what? You're not a citizen? And he's like, well, I kind of am. And that's when I started to learn about DACA. So we did an episode about it. The big thing in the news right now, December 5th of this year, 2020, well, it's whatever, <laughs> uh, federal judge just ruled to restore DACA after Trump had basically tried to dismantle it. DACA is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. So to anybody that's unfamiliar, which I don't know how you could be at this point, but I, it's not surprising if you're not, if you are unfamiliar. It is basically kids that were brought here when they were little by their parents from wherever and have grown up in America, gone to high schools here in some colleges. And then, you know, Obama put in an executive order in that allowed these people to have a path to citizenship, but they have to declare. So they have to become sort of like documented. Is that correct? 
Yeah, and it's not even a path to citizenship because the president doesn't have authority to do that. That have to go through Congress. But right. so it's a temporary program. Um, it started in 2012 because Obama was tired of Congress not acting. You know, when I started as an immigration attorney, as, as an immigration legal assistant in 2000, that's when this concept of dreamers really started taking um, taking form. Um, you know, what are we going to do with these kids that were brought here that have grown up here? The English is basically their first language language. They've gone to school here. They've graduated. And many of them started graduating and wanted to go to college and uh, or start working and finally realized that they did not have the status necessary to do those things that they wanted to do. So Congress started, um, you know, developing legislation that would provide a pathway to citizenship and it just never was able to get off the ground. Um, do a pushback mostly in the Senate. So Obama was frustrated. And so in 2012, he announced this program. The problem with an executive order that made this program is that um, it's e very easy to undo it. And so when Trump was um, was campaigning, he said he was going to undo the program. And that was the fear that many people had back in 2012, like, OK, we're going to sign up for this program. It's going to be every two years. You can renew it. They can take it away at any point. And if they decide to take it away, they're going to have all of our information, all of our family's information. And then what? Are you just going <clears> to <throat> round all of us up and, and, and deport the whole of us? Or, you know, what's going to happen? So uh, it's very, very um, un, unstable uh, to have a program like that. Yeah, that's the thing that people don't really understand that I was unaware of that I've learned through through more research of about DACA is exactly that is the fact that basically the government is asking people that have never had any reason to trust the government to come forward and and be like, here's where I live. This is my, you know, what I'm doing for work here and getting documented. You know, I think it's really a good thing for for I don't want to say our interests because I don't look at it that way like us and them. But it's good for the government's interests to have people declare, and as, and as far as citizens, because of crime and all that, because then you can keep tabs on someone. But like you said, the uncertainty of not knowing what the future holds, this is where when people, and this is going to get on a tangent for a second, but when people talk about socialism and they don't know what that means, they mean communism, like the big, bo big boogeyman, bad, you know, ooh, big bad socialism. The reason that socialism or, or communism would be bad in America is because we do have a change in leadership. You know, because and we swing so far one way or the other. And so if you get some some practices that are are maybe, you know, stop you from the from the top end of capitalism where you can't just soar and make so much money, uh, but they limit certain things and then it changes hands and then you can't actually then ever get back to that. top. Anyway, anyway I'm getting off the point. <laughs> uh, yeah. So DACA is currently it sits that it has been restored. That's true. That happened yeah. number fifth. Uh, to, to back it up a little bit, I mean, so he promised to end it. Then he was like, no, I'm going to give them something better. And then he finally did end it in 2017. And after that, then um, litigation started. So the case finally made it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court announced last June 2020 that he couldn't end it the way that he did. Not that he didn't have the power to end it, but just that the way that he did showed that there was some racial animus there, and that the basis for ending it was not appropriate. So we expected at that point that the program would restart. I mean, I had clients hire me to be able to file and we kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And the the word from the White House was, no, well, I, we don't care that the Supreme Court said that, like, we're going to do what we want to do. So they made another announcement in August saying, OK, no, 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 we're really ending this. And in fact, the, the one, they were allowing two year renewals and then they reduced it to one year renewal. So more litigation came off of that. And then it turned out that the guy who wrote that memo wasn't installed properly. And so that was void. Um, and so it's taken finally now until December, like you said, a federal judge to finally say, no, actually, you have to restart DACA. Like, because the Supreme Court, they don't really have authority to do that. They just said, no, what you did was wrong. Um, but they didn't ha really have the authority to say restart it. They just assume, we assume that, that the president of the United States would follow, you know, the, the the course of the Supreme Court and restart the program like he should have. But he didn't. So it took another federal court to say, no, actually, you have to restart it. And wow. so for now, it's on. Well, yeah. So now you had talked about how changes don't come from litigation. They come from legislation. So it's going to take Congress to act. And then it's going to take the Senate and Mitch McConnell to actually vote on it, which 
Georgia, come on, <laughs> you know, yeah, but, go Georgia. but what I mean, this is why representation matters. This is why we need people from communities, the Latinx community primarily. I mean, immigration, we when we say that we like you had talked about at the beginning of this, everybody's going to think Mexico or El Salvador or, you know, Central American countries. But it comes from everywhere. But Mexico is the big one. And so we definitely need Latinx representation uh, in Senate and Congress. And this and this is this is why, because then you get to, to hear these issues. Now, we're only getting kind of we're talking about the litigation and, end of it. Uh, you know, we could talk and maybe we will get to that a little bit, too, about the, just the personal issues that people face. But California is making a step to offer some more representation. Uh, the governor has appointed Senator designate Alex Padilla. He'll be the first uh, Latinx Senator in the state of California, which I found shocking, you know, not the first Senator in the country. The first was in the twenties in Florida, but the first in California. So he'll be replacing Kamala Harris. And I think that that could be really big mm -hmm. because California, the two senators from California have a lot of clout, have a lot of say, Yes, he'll be a freshman senator, but I think that the representation is going to be really big. I could see some bills being pushed. I think that when there's somebody that it affects their family personally and he presents some bill and then they have to kind of like squabble over it in politics, it's a little bit different than a faceless, nameless person, you know? So I'm excited to see what that can lead to. It's just really difficult when... Like I said before, I feel like the reason that some of these bills or these policies are enacted is is actually just to get votes. It's like one issue voters because mm -hmm. it doesn't actually affect people's lives the way that they try to, you know, act like their hair's on fire. <laughs> and and the Republican Party is extremely good at getting one issue voters, whether it's abortion, immigration, gun rights, yeah. ta taxes. That's basically it, you mm -hmm. know, and so. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. You know, some of the, I mean, let's talk about some of the personal stories. I know that you can't get into a ton because of it's, per, you know, but like broad that with your work with the people that you work with, what is the state of people when they come to you, when they come to you like about DACA and they say, I need to get paperwork. It sounds like when they're coming to you, they know what they're looking for, which they've done their research and they've done a, I mean, these are really intelligent people, you know? Yeah. And unfortunately some, um, so many times the answer is there's nothing that we can do for you. Uh, and that's why I hate to hear, well, if they really wanted to get legal status, they could do it. Right. right. And that's just ignorance because if they would, do you think that anybody, you know, if I, if I had to flee for my life from the U S which I've, you know, has honestly come to my mind, like what is the future of our country and will I need to leave this country? Sure. And then I have to go and be in the shadows in another country, maybe where I don't know the language or I don't understand what my rights are. Um, you know, that that is not a situation that people want to have long term. So, of course, they're not going to be looking for a way to legalize. I have so many people call me um, and 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 I talk with them or well, calling, I say, because uh, during COVID, but before COVID, people would come to my office and we'd sit down and I'd say, OK, I've been waiting 20 plus years, my child is now 21 years old. Um, you know, I believe that I should be able to be to receive my residency now. And I have to walk them through and explain all of the loopholes and all of the reasons why they are not going to be able to get a green card through that quote unquote anchor baby that everybody likes to talk about um, just because of the, the laws and the ways that uh, the laws have been written to exclude people um, from getting legal status. Right. Now, you, there's a lot of myths, too. Is With legal immigration, legal, whatever that, I mean, it's a difficult path. Is it true that there has to be the same amount of people from each country or from, like, I, I, how does that work? I know this is a bad question. But yeah, so there's, there's quotas. There's okay. limits that Congress yeah. has set that certain amount of people, unless you're an immediate relative, 
Uh, so immediate relative is like a spouse of a U.S. citizen, a child that's under 21, or a parent of a U.S. citizen. If you don't fit in those categories, let's say that you're a spouse of a permanent resident or you're a sibling of a citizen, then you have to wait in line um, because, the, because due to the limitations, there have been lines that have been created. And in Mexico, for example, the line for a sibling of a U.S. citizen is more than 20 years. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's what I mean. Is, is that, that's something that people don't understand. They're like, they need to do it legally and it's like yeah if they're from kazakhstan then maybe they have a chance to because there's well maybe not because of other issues right <laughs> no, but but uh just a, you know just a country that there's not a huge demand for people moving here uh and i'm p- pulling that one out of my neck but but yeah i don't know that's a big one uh that i think people just assume they're like oh there's a path like you just said get in line like it's just just like a line when you would vote on on election day where it's like six hours long. Yeah, it sucks, but it's you'll get it done in a day. It's like, no, dude, it's years. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, one of the best sources, the best sh- uh, presentations I've seen talking about legal immigration was on John Oliver on last week tonight. And it's crazy that a comedian, I mean, they have an incredible team and they do more than just just comedy. They're they're trying to uh, educate the masses they pr- trying to present information to you so then you can go and you can educate yourself, which is kind of what I'm trying to do with the show as well. I mean, I'm really bad at it. We're just going to have conversations and people can, then can learn where to turn and where to look and Google and learn from that, you know, it's but so, yeah, it's so important because, important because you don't know what you don't know. I mean, yeah, I remember exactly. when I was getting into immigration as a legal assistant, I had friends, I had uh, a lot of friends in the Latin- Latinx community and I had boyfriends and whatnot. And I thought I could just marry one of them and they would get their green card in the mail the next day. And I thought that when I went to go work for the immigration attorney that I worked for, uh, I just thought it was so, so easy. And I think that that's common that people think that, well, it's easy. And, and um, you know, you just, you can, if you get married to a citizen, then you have a green card automatically. And that's not true. There's many, many people married to U.S. citizens with U.S. citizen children who still cannot get status because of the laws on the books right now right yeah it'll be it'll be interesting to see what this next administration holds i unfortunately feel like it's such a difficult issue politically that that's going to have to that's going to be it's not going to change overnight because again you know biden is going to do everything he can to pander to the right which sucks but it is what it is and so you know because for some reason he has there's the moderate Democrats have this attitude where they're like, let's just get, we'll, we'll do things that the right likes. Be like, well, they're not going to like you period ever. I don't know why you're trying to pander to them and said, you know, get the support from the left. But yeah. Uh, when people, what are, what are the, the most, what is the most common um, service you provide, you know, as far as law for people in Lane County? Uh, Well, it's constantly changing. Um, A year or two ago, the biggest thing that we were doing was uh, working with asylum seekers. Uh, So people fleeing from Guatemala, Central America, and then Trump changed everything at the border and uh, refused to let people in, made them sit in migrant camps um, in Mexico to present their asylum cases. And so we stopped seeing people um, because people just weren't being allowed in. Um, I'm hopeful that that'll change again and um, that Biden will close those camps and <clears throat> allow people to come in to, to safety, <laughs> safely where they're, they've are they fled to safety and um, to be able to present those asylum cases. But we, we work with, um, we work with a lot of people who, who want to obtain status. Um, <clears throat> we help people get citizenship, uh, which is also not an automatic thing. Some people think that that's automatic also, but there's a lot of um, hoops that you have to jump through for that too. Um, there's work with a lot of people who need to uh, <clears throat> get waivers for um, because they've been in the country without status for so long. So like I said, even though that they're married to a U.S. citizen, they're, they're still going to have to go through a very lengthy process, um, sometimes two, three, four years um, to be able to get status. Very expensive. Um, during COVID, things a lot of things have been shut down, but we've still been able to get some things through. So we had like a couple who was uh, stuck in Australia. Um, they'd gone there to work before COVID hit and then um, their work visas were expiring in in, um, January this month. And so we worked hard to get them, um, get him a green card to come here through marriage um, to his, went there as as boyfriend, girlfriend, and then they got married and 
now they're able to come here. But that was kind of like a Christmas miracle because so much has been just so complicated through COVID. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's affected everything and it's going to affect you know, small local government, I've been saying this a bunch, it's going to affect local government's ability to do anything, you know, because the revenue is going to be gone. And so, uh, and then, you know, that's why this whole stimulus stuff is really difficult because part of me is like, yeah, we really need to help people. You know, you can't shut businesses down without helping people, but then where's the money coming from? You know, and it's a difficult thing. That's not very democratic of me to say, but it's true. It's true. You know, I mean, we can't just keep printing money. And so I don't know, it's difficult, but it does suck when you have one person, Mitch McConnell, that makes the decisions for the entire country, you know, and that's something that needs to change. And I hope people in Georgia are paying attention, but well, Abigail Molina, I appreciate you. I appreciate the work that you do. Uh, Every time someone comes on my show for the first time, it's, it's basically just kind of a feeling out process as time goes by and the relationship behind the scenes with you brought, you know, gets bigger or gets better and stronger for me. I'll keep bringing you back on and we'll talk more about, you know, how things are progressing. I'm really anxious to see what the Biden administration will, will do. I mean, it can't be anything like what we've seen with Trump. I think populism is why you have some of these anti-immigrant stances in politics is because, you know, a guy like Marco Rubio, Marco Rubio had been and Jeb Bush in Florida because in Florida, they're like, Oh crap, I can't be anti-immigrant and get elected because it's an immigrant population. So you'll see how they, they kind of navigate that politically is really interesting because they'll say things like, you know, trying to the pride of the immigrant story or whatnot. And then at the end of the day, in the 11th hour, then they don't do anything to help them, (laughs) you know? Yeah, but it's like everybody forgets that we're all all immigrants. I I was just going to say that. Yeah. Unless you have 100% native blood, you have you, your heritage is, is some some other country and Well, you know, so my immigrants. my family story in on my mom's side is Irish and and obvi- you know, there's a history of the way that the Irish people were treated when they came here uh that was really poor and when Trump made that comment where he said they don't send their best people you know, they don't send their best. Basically, I I wouldn't say, I t- well, I kind of took offense to that as an Irish immigrant, as an Irish uh, American kid, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm like second generation American, but still, because uh, people that came here from Ireland had nothing, had nothing, you know? And so, I mean, every one of us is either an immigrant or a Native American, that's it. You know, the children of immigrants or Native American, that's it. And so... I think that sometimes it we need to look we need to look at our family stories and then look at the family stories of others and realize that there's more similarities than there is differences. And so I, I that's the first thing I thought when I when I saw that I was like, dude, what about my ancestors that came here like six, 50, 60 years ago? It's like not even it's like really a blink in the eye as far as the big scheme of things with time. You know, he would have looked at it the same way. It'd have been like these vile little. Irish, you know, dudes, whatever. I don't know. Well, I appreciate you. I uh, appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, thanks for doing this. You know, check out uh, Abigail Molina's husband's podcast. He's been, he's super passionate about it. He's doing her cool. Mark Molina. Um, what is it? It's called Molina Leadership Business Solutions. It's really long. Yeah, I think he just shortened it. Molina Leadership Solutions. <laughs> cool. He's doing a, a series right now on uh, women in leadership. Role. Yeah, really neat. And speaking of Ireland, he just did one with a woman from Northern Ireland that I haven't had a chance to digest yet. But from the little bit that I clipped around, it was really cool. And so he's doing some really good stuff, you know, and so we've got a really tight little knit podcast community behind the scenes. And it's great to I've met you briefly, but it's great to chat with you and get to know you better. And I'm sure that we'll do some more work behind the scenes. Springfield's got a lot going for it. Absolutely. You know? And I think it's really cool that I've kind of geared this podcast towards more people from Springfield now because it just is, there's not a lot of uh, coverage for, for Springfield. And so there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes, a lot of unsung heroes like yourself. And so keep doing what you're doing. I think it's great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. So I'm going to end this with a song. This is a good friend of mine, the Trent brothers, Dan and Adam Trent, and then their band cold fire. So this is the song. What could I say? Thanks a lot.
up the sun.